Welcome back everyone. I'm Dr. Rhett Smith for ProtonGuru.com. Today we're studying lesson 4.11 and in this lesson we'll talk about what influence the substituent already present on a benzene ring might have on the rate that an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction has. And one sort of observation I want to point out to you is that if people try the same electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction, whichever one it is, on each of these five substrates, they observe that the nitrobenzene is the least reactive, followed by fluorobenzene, benzene right in the middle. So these two reactions are slower than the same reaction with just benzene. But if I put a methyl group on and try toluene and do the same electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction a little faster than if I try that same reaction on just benzene, and if I have anisole with the OCH3 group, that's the most reactive. It happens most quickly. One thing I want to remind you about in trying to predict which reaction would be faster is that we have a carbocation intermediate. So a more stable carbocation will lead to a more rapid reaction. We have the same idea when we talk about substitution reactions. Remember when we have an SN1 reaction that will work on both a secondary and a tertiary substrate, but the tertiary substrates are faster for the SN1 reactions or the E1 reactions because of that more stable carbocation you form. So the same principle applies to electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. Well, what makes a carbocation more stable? It's when you have groups nearby to help donate electrons to that carbocation. So in studying electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions, scientists quickly realize that if they put electron donating groups on the benzene, then these reactions will be faster for electrophilic aromatic substitution than if you just had benzene where you don't have anything donating electrons to that intermediate carbocation. But on the other hand, if you put something on the benzene ring that pulls electrons away, and you're trying to make a cation, like fluorine, for example, very electronegative, would like to pull electrons away from benzene, that's not good for trying to make a carbocation on the ring because donating electrons to a cation makes it more stable. Trying to pull electrons away from something that's already positive, that's difficult. So if you put electron withdrawing groups on the benzene ring, that substrate will be much slower for electrophilic aromatic substitution than if you did that same reaction on unsubstituted benzene. So conceptually, this all kind of makes sense based on what we know about organic chemistry already. We can also kind of describe this reaction visually instead of conceptually by drawing these reaction coordinate diagrams. We could say, okay, if I try two different electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions, one given by trace A, that's the solid trace, and the second one given by the dash trace, trace B. If I try these two different reactions, and I know that the intermediate is given by the sort of valley for reaction A and B, I say, well, if my carbocation intermediate is more stable for A, very often the more stable intermediate in a reaction requires less energy to make, a lower energy of activation barrier to that step. We know that a lower energy of activation corresponds to a faster reaction. So if I compare two reactions, the one that's faster will be the one with the more stable intermediate. Kind of the same thing we said in the previous page, but displayed in terms of a visual representation by this graph. So a more stable intermediate generally forms more quickly. And this brings us back to our overarching concept for this lesson, that anything that stabilizes the cation intermediate will speed up the reaction for the electrophilic aromatic substitution case. So what we need to do is think about if we were to do a reaction make an intermediate plus charge on the ring, if we add an electrophile, what influence would the substituent have on the stability of that carbocation? Well, one thing we can say is if that substituent right next to the ring, the X, has a lone pair, it's going to push electrons through resonance at that plus charge, let's say, and that will be very stabilizing. We refer to that type of substituent as being very activating. Key examples of this type of substituent, think about the elements we have that have lone pairs. So this is where it's attached to the benzene ring. Maybe an OH or an OR group. Maybe an NH or R groups could be here as well. Those are going to be good electron donating groups and they're very activating. Except for halogens. I would never want a fluorine. If this was fluorine, the most electronegative atom, it would never want to donate its electrons to that plus charge. And the other atoms are far too big, and their lone pairs are far away from the atom itself, and not a good match in size to the carbons. We don't have effective resonance. 
So the halogens are actually slightly deactivating for this process because they're electronegative. And again, you don't want to have something pulling electrons away from that plus charge. So if you think about the mechanism by which you have this activation or deactivation, you see that you have resonance donation. So these are often called resonance donors. And if I have electronegativity pulling electron density away through the bonds, you call this an inductive effect. So they're inductive withdrawing groups. And what if the substituent's a hydrocarbon? It doesn't have a lone pair and it's not very electronegative to pull electrons away from the plus charge. Well, if this is just an alkyl group compared to H, say, so, well, putting an extra R substituent onto that carbocation would make it a tertiary carbocation, right? It's secondary if this stuff's not here at all. But if I put a methyl group or something here, then I have a tertiary carbocation. Well, that would be good because we know that a tertiary carbocation is more stable than a secondary one. So those are inductive donor groups. They slightly activate the ring to reaction by electrophilic aromatic substitution. And what about a case where I don't have a lone pair? I don't have an electronegative atom necessarily attached here. I don't have an R group. What if I have something like carbon double bond O, H, like an aldehyde, or if this is an R, it's a ketone. Then what happens? Well, if I have an electronegative atom y and I pull electrons away from x and put, create a partial positive there. Now I'm trying to make a cation right next to a plus charge. That is bad because plus repels plus. So if y is electronegative, so element y adjacent to the directly attached element, or if this site here is just a positive charged atom by itself, even if nothing else is there, plus plus, the concept is the same. Anything that puts a plus charge or a partial plus charge on the X atom makes this ring very unsusceptible to making a carbocation that would be destabilized by that influence. So those are the most deactivating groups, which I'll call very deactivating. They could be resonance withdrawing groups or strong inductive withdrawing groups. So if we summarize these four groups, we have activating. These are the resonance donors that have an O lone pair or N lone pair directly attached to the benzene ring. We have some things that can't use resonance to help stabilize the cation, but can inductively through hyperconjugation stabilize them. These are just the alkyl groups. Then we have the atoms that are either too electronegative or too large to engage in resonance donation, so they instead act as inductive withdrawing groups. These are the halogens. And then you have the groups that place a partial positive or a plus one formal plus one charge atom right next to the benzene ring, that really deactivates these compared to benzene for the electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction, or indeed any reaction that requires a carbocation intermediate. And that will include groups like aldehydes or ketones or nitro groups or the sulfonic acid groups. So we can think about this and show sort of a large list of potential substituents on benzene and say, well, what affects the ability of an element to donate electrons to carbon? First of all, we can think about size. If the element is not about the same size, not in the same row as carbon, it's too big to effectively overlap the pi system. It can't engage in resonance. That's why you don't see resonance donation from these large elements. Electronegativity is also important. Fluorine is very electronegative. It will not be activating. It will not be donating electrons to the benzene ring. So with these general ideas, things we talked about in the past couple slides, we can figure out just how activating a group might be. We didn't talk about in the past few slides which is more activating, N with a lone pair or O with a lone pair. Well, which one donates electrons more easily to the carbon? Nitrogen and oxygen are both the same size. They're in the same row as carbon. Nitrogen is not quite as electronegative as oxygen. So if we're talking about giving electrons to a carbocation, right? you can just envision a C plus right beside these groups and say which one of these is the more favorable resonance. Well, it's easier to pull electrons away from nitrogen than carbon, so it's more activating. Then we have groups that can't engage in resonance donation, like this. And you can look down here and say, well, this is a nitrogen lone pair. Why is it not as good as this at activating the benzene ring? Well, it's because you can do resonance to the benzene ring. Right, The end of the bond here is showing where it attaches the benzene in all these cases. If I try to donate that way, that's that's good, but I also have potential for resonance that way. Then you sort of have a tug of war on the nitrogen's lone pair. Over on the deactivating side, you can think about 
which one of these has the most positive charge on the partial positive carbon. This one has one oxygen. This one has two oxygens pulling on that carbon for its electron density. And then down here you have a formal plus charge on these nitrogens. So they become more and more deactivated. This is more and more positive charge. So it all kind of makes sense conceptually. You want to be able to donate as much electron density as possible to the carbocation to activate the ring to make that cation. If you're really, really positive, that repels the plus charge, prevents you from forming it as easily. So to figure out a lot of the reactivity and regiochemistry and isomers of products we're going to get later in the semester, we need to be able to identify these groups, whatever substituent attached to benzene, and this notation I'm showing with a squiggly line just shows where does the benzene attach. We need to be able to designate, are these groups activating, only slightly activating compared to benzene, slightly deactivating compared to benzene, or quite deactivating, just deactivating compared to benzene. All right, so if the substituent is just H, it's benzene. If I put one of these other groups on, it's going to influence the stability of the carbocation, how fast it can be formed. We know that any alkyl group is slightly activating because it's good at stabilizing the carbocation through hyperconjugation. For compounds where an O is attached right to the ring or an N, we need to know whether it has a lone pair. Only if it has a lone pair can it donate to the carbocation we're trying to make through resonance. So that's quite activating if it can donate through resonance. SO3H, you need to draw out the Lewis dot structure probably to see what you would have in terms of the structure. So if I draw that out attached to benzene, say, wow, the sulfur has three oxygens pulling on it. It's very positive. That's pretty bad if we're trying to make a very positive sulfur go right beside a positive carbon on a carbocation. So that's quite deactivating. Same strategy here. Nitrogen can sometimes have a formal charge of plus one, sometimes neutral, sometimes negative one. Here it's neutral. And if you figure out what Electrons must be present, knowing that people don't always draw lone pairs in. You say, well, this nitrogen has a lone pair. It could donate those electrons to a carbocation, should it form beside it. That's quite activating. Alkyl group, good at hyperconjugation, slightly activating. Chlorine's a halogen. It's too big to do effective donation to the carbon. It's slightly deactivating because of its electron withdrawing nature through induction. Here they've drawn out the formal charge of plus. If you're trying to put a plus by a plus, that's terribly unfavorable because of the repulsion of plus for plus. That's deactivating, not just slightly deactivating, full on deactivating. NO2 can be deceptive. If you just look and say, oh, there's an N by the benzene, it must be activating. Then you'll, you won't get this right. NO2, if you draw out the nitro group, we've done that a couple times in the course already, you draw it out, you see there's a formal plus on the N, formal minus on the O, but it's the N that's right by the ring. So if I try to make a carbocation, that's really quite like this one, where I have deactivation because I'm trying to put a formal plus by a formal plus. Another halogen, slightly deactivating just like the other halogen. They're all in the same category with each other. And then finally, example 10 here, we have a case where we have a polar bond, but the polar bond is putting a plus partial plus right by the, where the carbocation is trying to form. We're talking about it being on a benzene ring. So that's deactivating. All right, so that's all well and good, being able to identify what type of substituent we have. But what kind of problems can we really solve with this knowledge? Well, here's a pretty simple example of a type of problem that, that I've seen in a lot of organic tests. Rank these arenes from 1 through 5 in terms of their reactivity towards electrophilic aromatic substitution. One being the most reactive, I'll highlight that to make sure I don't rank them incorrectly. Five being least reactive. Explain your selections. Well, the explanation would simply be that you're trying to stabilize a carbocation intermediate with donors. It will be destabilized if there are electron withdrawing groups. So the first thing I'm going to do is label each of these compounds based on the type of substituent they have. Here I have a resonance donor. Right? I can donate through resonance if I make a positive charge on the benzene ring. I say, okay, this is a resonance donor, which is activating. CF3, I've got three fluorines all pulling electrons away from the carbon. Well, that's deactivating. All the halogens belong to the slightly deactivating category. 
All the alkyl groups belong to the slightly activating category, and this is just benzene, doesn't have any substituents, so it's sort of in the middle. It's sort of our point of reference. So the fastest one will be the one that is activated, so 1. Slightly activated means a little faster than benzene, 2. Now the slightly deactivated and the deactivated ones are slower than benzene. Right? Benzene's our point of reference, so benzene's in the middle at 3. Now the slowest one is the full-on deactivated one, and that leaves you with this only slightly deactivated one at, coming at number 4, slightly slower than benzene. So just knowing these sort of pretty simple rules for figuring out what type of substituent you have lets you rank all five of these compounds in terms of their reactivity rate to electrophilic aromatic substitution. In our next lesson, we'll talk not only about the rate of electrophilic aromatic substitution, but if I take a compound that already has a substituent and do a reaction, I need to be able to tell whether my reaction places the next substituent in the ortho position, the meta position, or the para position to see which is the major product. And that's what we'll do in our next lesson.